Can we do both of them? Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome all of you to the Center of Comparative and Public Law Public Lecture Series. Today we are very honored and uh, privileged to have Professor Christopher Forsyth, a world-renowned expert on public law and judicial review with us. Professor Christopher Forsyth holds the Chair of Public Law and Private International Law at the University of Cambridge. He is the author of the authoritative textbook, Administrative Law, which is used by many, as well as cited regularly by courts and counsel throughout the common law world. Professor Forsyth is the author of more than nine other textbooks on different aspects of public law and private international law, as well as a substantive volume of world-leading journal articles. Professor Falsaf is a recorder and regularly sits in the Crown Court as a judge. He is also a bencher of the Inner Temple. Today, we are very happy to have Professor Falsaf to talk about the recent reform of the application of judicial review in England, lesson for Hong Kong. So please join me in welcoming Professor Falsaf. Thank you all very much. It's, uh, I'm delighted to be here, as I always am in Hong Kong. I just am a bit busy on this occasion. Every day seems to be full of events of one kind or another. And so forgive me if I show some signs of the jet lag that is still affecting me. Um, the application for judicial review in England has been undergoing a period of reform, led by the last Lord Chancellor but one, Lord Chancellor Christopher Grayling who is the first Lord Chancellor for many centuries not to be a lawyer. And as a non-lawyer, he takes a relatively dim view of judicial review. And it is his Lord Chancellorship that has driven the reforms that I'm now about to describe. But his place has been taken by another non-lawyer, Michael Gove, 
uh, who has become Lord Chancellor uh, when the Conservative government took power after the general election in May. Michael Gove is also a non-lawyer, but he's a rather different kettle of fish to Christopher Grayling in that he is less concerned, it seems to me, about judicial review and rather more concerned about human rights law reform. So it is likely that the judicial review for reforms that I'm about to describe will be the last for some time instead of the first wave in even more substantial reforms uh, driven by Christopher Gray. I think I will start, too, by saying a word or two about statistics um, to give you some idea of the difference between the UK, the UK or England, rather, uh, and Hong Kong in terms of size. As I understand the Hong Kong statistics, there are about 200 or so applications for judicial review a, a year, a relatively modest amount. One of the factors that drove the reform in England has been the fact that over the past 15 years there's been a growth in the numbers from about three or 4,000 applications for judicial review a year uh, to about 15,000. Should I hold this with that help? And can the people at the back here? Yes, I see some. Uh, I, I see some heads nodding, so we must be all right. So we've seen this tremendous growth in numbers, and that was largely behind Christopher Grayling's dislike of the application for judicial review. He saw the application for judicial review swamping the courts, as he, as he saw it, and many of those applications being essentially frivolous or a waste of time. But when you look a little more deeply into those statistics, a rather different picture emerges. The growth was essentially in immigration cases, as more and more people bring applications for judicial review seeking to overturn adverse immigration decisions. These applications for judicial review are perfectly understandable because the applicants are in extremis. They are about to be removed from the United Kingdom and they want to stay in the United Kingdom. And it's not surprising that they use every possible avenue of relief they can find. And it's also not surprising that the application for judicial review is what they choose to uh, use to seek that relief. And, but there is a truth about judicial review applications of which I'm sure many people in this room are well aware, namely every application for judicial review sails under false colours. We all know that judicial review is about process and legality, not about merits. But no one has ever applied for judicial review when they agreed with the merits of the decision, um, but they took a, a, a dim view of, of the process. No one has ever applied for judicial review allowing them to stay in the United Kingdom, saying, I'm very pleased that you've allowed me to stay in the, in the United Kingdom, but this decision must be quashed because of the failure to give me a proper hearing on such and such a date. Every application for judicial review then represents an, a, an applicant who is unhappy with the merits of a particular decision, but they must present their application for judicial review as a challenge to the legality of the decision in question. And of course, many of these immigration judicial reviews are very weak. There's no real ground upon which the application could succeed, um, but they've been undertaken by people desperate to be allowed to remain in the United, in the United Kingdom. However, the decision was taken even prior to Christopher Grayling becoming Lord Chancellor to shift all immigration judicial reviews towards an appellate tribunal, a quite recently established appellate tribunal in the law of the United Kingdom, the Upper Tribunal, which is a very august body. It is by statute a superior court of record, uh, and it is also um, 
uh, has all the powers, powers of the High Court, including a judicial review jurisdiction. But it sits, sits as a tribunal, uh, not as a court, and the decision had been taken to transfer all these, ju these immigration judicial reviews uh, to the upper tribunal. And that is where they are in the process of going at the moment. And when you then look at what is going to be left in the High Court, it's back to the old level of three to 4,000, perhaps some slight growth, three to 4,000 a year. So a lot of the pressure has been taken off the High Court as far as judicial review is concerned. Of course, the, the pressure has grown on the upper tribunal but the Lord Chancellor seemed relatively less concerned about what happened in the upper tribunal as opposed to what happened uh, in, in the High Court. So the statistics can be misleading. And while we're on statistics, can I just mention another point uh, that is quite intriguing that comes out of the statistics? And if anybody wants references to these statistical issues, you'll find them in the footnotes of the relevant pages of administrative law. Um, what has happened with this growth in, in numbers when there's a relatively constant judicial resource, the number of judges nominated to sit in the administrative court remains essentially the same over this 10 year, 10, 15 year, year period when the applications are growing. The number of judges remains, uh, remains much the same, but the number of applications uh, quadruples or s something close to quadru quadruples, then what happens? Either the delays must grow or it becomes more difficult to obtain leave. And the answer is it becomes more difficult to obtain leave. The judges are not, of course, doing it as a clear decision and act of policy. But in reality, there is an adjustment of the leave requirement to match the demand for judicial review towards the resources. So I just make, make that point not directly uh, relevant to my general talk this evening, but to give by way of some background. So that's the background uh, under which Chris Grayling uh, begins his, his reforms. And the first of them is contained in Civil Procedure Rule 54.12.7. Uh, Civil Procedure Rules Part 54 is what in England has taken the place of what is still in Hong Kong, Order 53, uh, the old application for judicial review. Now again, we all know that applications for judicial review are made on paper in the first instance. Uh, you apply for leave to apply for judicial review on, on the papers, filling in the appropriate Form 86 in, 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 in Hong Kong and put it into the judge. In Hong Kong, the judge decides ex parte without hearing the other side. Although sometimes I understand notice is given and, and counsel can be heard, but it's not uh, as a matter of general practice. In England, we now have a reform, an earlier reform than the Chris Grayling reforms, in which the respondent or the putative respondent files an acknowledgement of service once the uh, documents have been served on him. And in that acknowledgement of service, he has an opportunity to explain, or the respondent, uh, corporate body or whatever direction, whatever kind of body it may be, a minister, has an opportunity to explain why leave shouldn't be granted. And that is quite often successful. There's quite a skill in filing in an acknowledgement of service of landing a knockout blow in the application for judicial review to bring it to an end there at the leave stage. And that's a, a reform that I understand Hong Kong considered and decided not, not to adopt. I have to say I've been persuaded that it is quite a useful re reform. Um, the, the Professor Kong didn't mention one of my distinctions, so perhaps I should be hesitant about mentioning it myself, uh, but uh, I sit myself 
uh, has have been duly authorised to sit in the administrative court as a deputy, and the, the kind of work that a that, that a deputy does uh, is generally to sit in chambers considering leave applications. Uh, I've done a done a lot of lot of these, um, and I have to say, as a judge trying to make a proper decision on whether the particular application for judicial review shows there's a good arguable case. An acknowledgement of service is very helpful in seeing the weaknesses but also the strengths in the, the other side's case. So I've become persuaded to the advantages of, of an acknowledgement of service, but in Hong Kong, as I understand it, there was a strong feeling from the bar that no possible avenue of redress should be closed to the applicant and the chance of being able to get leave on an ex parte basis without the other side being heard uh, was too uh, was too tempting and so it was stopped. <coughs> anyway, now in England we have gone further than that and in Civil Procedure Rules Part 54 tw 12 7 should the judge, when refusing leave on the papers, record that the application is totally without merit, the claimant may not request that the decision to be the decision to be reconsidered at a hearing. In other words, the option that was previously open to an applicant, turned down on the papers in their leave application, of renewing their their application orally before the judge, has been removed from them if it has been certified as totally without merit. Of course, even if it's found to be totally without merit, it can still be appealed to the Court of Appeal. But the Lord Chancellor thought of that one, and in Civil Procedure <coughs> Rules 52, 15, 1AB, it's now provided that the application for permission to appeal will be determined on paper without an oral hearing. So if the leave, the first judge hearing the application and deciding upon leave decides that this is totally without merit, then the door to an oral hearing is slammed shut. Uh, and the most that the applicant will be able to do will be to ventilate on paper why he disagrees with the leave judge who refused him permission and considered the application to be totally without merit. I may say it is very difficult to find an application totally without merit. And there, you may feel that the merit is pretty slim, but to find it, find it totally without merit is, is, is quite hard. Um, so I don't think that that has made that much difference. Uh, but it, you can see what it's designed to do is to turn away the very weak application for judicial review in which a strong case is not made for some illegality uh, in the decision-making process. So that's the first reform in England, the totally without merit reform. And the second, re uh, second reform is contained in section 85 of the 2015 Act, which I should have mentioned earlier. This is the Criminal Justice and Courts Act of 2015, Part 4, which contains these reforms. And Section 85 makes, a, makes changes to the no difference principle. And perhaps I should explain the kind of case that the government has in mind here. The government has in mind the kind of case where someone who should have been consulted before a decision has been made was not consulted. And as you'll be aware, in Hong Kong, as in, as in England, there are very broad duties of consultation imposed upon decision makers these days. Somebody should have been consulted and they haven't been consulted. If they thereafter apply for judicial review, they could arguably, at any rate, establish that they should have been consulted. That should be enough for leave to be granted they've established a good arguable case. But of course, many other people have been consulted. 
and the government believes in many of these cases, whatever points the consultee might have been able to raise would doubtless have been raised by somebody else and fully taken into account by the decision maker. It is therefore completely pointless to allow that judicial review to continue. And that is what justifies the denial of relief or leave. And if we look then at page 88, uh, not page 85, uh, sorry, my apologies, I stumbled across a, uh, a, a typo on my, on my note. This is at the top of page 80, uh, top of page 3. I refer to section 85, but it's actually section 84. Likelihood of substantially different outcome for the applicant. And it puts in a new section 2A of the Senior Courts Act, section 31. The High Court must refuse to grant relief on an application for judicial review. You can't make an award of damages. If it appears to the court to be highly likely that the outcome for the applicant would not have been substantially different if the conduct complained of had not occurred. So if it's highly likely that there'd be no difference, then relief cannot be granted. And further down the page, under the addition of section 3C to section 31 of the Senior Courts Act, when considering whether to grant leave to make an application, the High Court must consider if the outcome would be different. But the crucial one is 3D. Again, if when considering that question, it appears to the High Court to be highly likely that the outcome for the applicant would not have been substantially different, the court must refuse to grant leave. These provisions were incredibly controversial in the House of Lords. They were driven through the, the House of Commons, but they were incredibly controversial in the House of Lords as restricting too much access to the, to the court and the benefit of judicial review. And this eventually led to the compromise that one sees in part in, in section, subsection 2b and subsection 3e, still on that page 3. The court may disregard the requirements in subsection 2a a and b if it <coughs> considers that it's appropriate to do so for reasons of exceptional public interest. And the same test, exceptional public interest, applies to the grant of leave. So, even if you think it's highly likely that it would make no difference, there may be a case for exceptional public interest allowing the judicial override to continue. There were an exceptional array of eminent opponents of this uh, proposition in the House of Lords. Uh, earlier Lord, Lord Chancellors, retired judges, retired law lords, and the, the like, and so uh, they were adamant that the proposal was not to take uh, form in law in its original form and insisted upon that compromise and the government uh, accepted the, 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 the compromise. It's not entirely clear to me how significant Section 84 is going to, going to be. There are lots of people, of the eminent judges, uh, judges and others I've mentioned, who consider it to be a thoroughly re retrograde step. But there will be, again, relatively few cases in which it will be possible to say at leave stage the, that the outcome would not have been substantially different if the conduct complained of had not occurred. There might be more cases at the remedy stage, since at that stage all the facts should be clear but it is quite likely that the remedial discretion would in any event already have been exercised in such cases. So it's not clear quite how significant it's going to be, other than the point that I make on the note, which is that it's doubtless going to make judicial review much more complicated in that there will be something else for the parties to argue over and for the judge to <coughs> consider in deciding whether to grant leave. And so that's the second reform that we've seen in, in England, the no difference principle. 
And then perhaps it's just before leaving that topic, it's worth remarking that there is, of course, already a no difference principle that the, the courts can deploy at common law where it's clear that the particular application would lead to no difference uh, in, the, in the outcome of the decision-making process. They can already short-circuit it by refusing relief in discretion or in extreme cases leave. So whether it will make that much difference or not, I don't know. The third reform is costs in the provision of financial information. And here, uh, it's the, the sections, sections 85 to 90 are just far too long, so I haven't set them out on the, on the note, but have summarized their import. And in a way, these arise over a case with a Hong Kong connection, the Plantagenet Alliance case, that I give the reference at the bottom of page four. The Hong Kong election uh, connection is that the, the judge who, who heard the case was Haddon Cave, J, uh, who the son of the father who was financial secretary, I think, for, for many years. And he's still, uh, still remembered in Hong Kong, I see from the heads nodding. Anyway, that was the Hong Kong connection in the Plantagenet Alliance case. That Dungeness Alliance case is, 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 is a case that really irritated the then the Lord Chancellor, Christopher Grayling. It's about the discovery of the remains of King Richard III in a car, pool, car park in Leicester in England. After some very excellent archaeology, it was determined this is where he was likely to be buried, in the middle of the car, pop, car park. Uh, Leicester University or, or professors from Leicester University carried out the archaeology, located the located a, a, a skeleton in the car park, car park, did DNA analysis and discovered that it was indeed the remains of King King Richard III. Um, and the question then was, what was to be done with the remains of King Richard III? And there were several schools of thought of which two emerged as the most, most prominent. One, that he should be buried in Leicester, in Leicester Cathedral, after all, that's where he had died and he was killed at the Battle of Bosworth. And the other was that he should be returned to York, since he was a Yorkist, and be buried in York Cathedral. Now, this was a matter to be decided by the Lord Chancellor under the Burials Act of 1857. He had to issue a license permitting the burial of these remains, and he duly issued a license allowing them to be buried in Leicester. And this, of course, was what was challenged on judicial review. But who, who brought the judicial review? Well, you brought it against the Lord Chancellor, so you're bringing it against the, the, the state with all the resources and wealth of the state, knowing that if you lose, that there'd almost invariably be a costs order against you. So how are you going to protect yourself against that <coughs> costs order? The various collateral descendants, the collateral is important, they weren't members of the royal family, but they were descendants of, of Richard III, decided to set up the Plantagenet Alliance to bring the application for judicial review, appreciating that any costs order against the Plantagenet Alliance would be unpaid since it was simply a shell company. Um, but they would be secure that they wouldn't have, they'd obviously have to f find the cost to pay for their own counsel, but they'd be able to escape uh, paying the Lord Chancellor's costs if they lost. And of course they did lose in the end, um, although not with, w without some sort of quite awkward moments uh, along the way, including a statement in the first judgment that there was no such thing as an un sorry that there was such a thing as an unfettered discretion in an administrative law, whereas my first year students of administrative law in Cambridge know that there's no such thing as an unfettered discretion in administrative law. It's somewhat disconcerting to find a judge saying 
uh, and the Plantagenet Alliance case that there was. Anyway, all that was sorted out. Uh, I can tell you with a, a sense of relief that the proposition that there was no ad that, that there was an unfettered discretion in, in administrative law, which is what the Lord Chancellor wanted to be found, because it would mean he could make up grant alliances to remove the remove the remains to be buried wherever he wished, because it was an unfettered discretion. That is that, that that heresy has been scotched. We now know that there's no such thing as an unfettered discretion in administrative law. But there's still the problem with the costs. The Lord Chancellor wanted to be able to get at the costs of the actual backers of the get at the assets of the actual backers of the Plantagenet Alliance. And that is why sections 85 onwards of the 2015 Act require financial information to be made available uh, to the court to take into consideration uh, when deciding upon costs. Section 85 requires every applicant for judicial review to provide the court with information about the financing of the application. And that includes information about the source, nature, and extent of financial resources available or likely to be available to the applicant to meet liabilities arising in connection with the application. And if the applicant is a body corporate that is unable to demonstrate that it is likely to have financial resources available to meet the liabilities, information about its members and about their ability to provide financial support for the purpose of the application also have to be provided. Then in considering a costs order, the court must consider whether to order costs to be paid by any person other than a party to the proceedings who is identified in that financial information as someone who is providing financial support for the purpose of the proceedings or likely or able to do so. In other words, in cases like the Plantagenet Alliance, the court should consider, consider costs against the actual backers of the litigation. It may well be thought that it is over the top to require financial disclosure in each, disclosure in each and every application, although this is now the law in England. For most applicants for judicial review who, will be, who are still funded by legal aid uh, or from the claimant's own resources, this is just another irksome hoop, hoop that they're going to have to jump through in making a return setting out their financial resources as part of their application for judicial review. On the other hand, it's, it seems to me that in the absence of a utopia in which legal, pay, legal aid pays for everything, it seems reasonable that the true backers of the judicial review claimant should bear the risks of an adverse cost, cost order, that one shouldn't be able by setting up shell companies and the like to avoid the normal consequences uh, of an adverse cost order. Uh, and it is, of course, true that there will be good applicants who cannot bring the application because they're too fearful of a cost order. That is a wider problem, but it's one that is at least partly addressed with the fifth reform that we'll look at, which is the capping of costs or the protective costs order. Reform four. In the past few decades, there has been a growing appearance of interveners in judicial review cases. And I think the courts would very often take the view that the, this is a positive development in that interveners of, often have a broader and more useful perception of the issues that arise uh, than the claimants necessarily have or than the respondents necessarily have. So interveners are largely seen, I think it's fair to say, as, as a good development in judicial review. But who's going to pay their costs? Now the interveners have benefited quite fre frequently in the past when a costs order is made against a claim, or in favor of a claim, depending on the circumstances, 
that largely through the, um, the views of the intervener, largely as a result of what the intervener has placed before the court, then it was reasonable that costs should be awarded in favour of the interveners, so they got their costs. Again, there was a sense within the government that this was encouraging too much interveners by professional interveners who tried to get to persuade the courts to go down the particular route that they would rather like the court to go down for broader political reasons. Uh, and so the position in regard to interveners has been restricted. A relevant party to the proceedings, <coughs> says Section 87, may not be ordered by the High Court to pay the interveners' costs in connection with the proceedings. And that is again subject to there being exceptional circumstances. Uh, does not prevent the court making an order if it considers there are exceptional circumstances. Another compromise in the House of Lords. Again, quite what those exceptional circumstances might be remains to be seen. I thought I should just mention here which isn't on the note. <coughs> I seem I'm able to find my own note. Here we are. In the case of designing Hong Kong against the Town Planning Board, HKL 49 2014, um, Mr. Justice R refused an application for a protective costs order in that case, but the matter is on appeal, and so it remains to be seen what is going to happen to protective costs orders in Hong Kong. Um, but that is the final reform that I turn to consider. Just for some background, I've set out a passage from administrative law that sets out the position in England where issues raised are truly ones of general public importance, the court may make a protective costs order. This is an order made by the court at any stage, but usually uh, after permission has been granted. Permission is the word used in England for leave. We usually after permission has been granted, to the effect that, irrespective of the outcome, the court will make no order as to costs against the claimant or that any order will not exceed a stated sum. In the past, the rule was that the claimant had to have no private interest. So the typical applicant for, for a protective costs order was a pressure group rather than an individual with a direct interest. But this application has been significantly diluted, and the current approach is to apply the requirement of direct interest flexibility. But by this is meant that the private interest should not be a disqualifying factor but its weight and its importance in the overall context of the case should be taken into consideration by the judge. Now, protective costs orders turned out to be very useful in England, but they also raise, I think, quite difficult issues of principle. They're very useful in the sense that they enable judicial reviews to be heard when it's clearly in the public interest that the judicial review should be heard. by giving a claimant some sort of guarantee that either they won't have adverse costs order against them so that they only have their own costs defined, or that the, any adverse costs against them will be limited to a relatively modest sum so they can proceed with the litigation with some confidence. But what that really does is to shift the, the costs burden onto the respondent public authority of one kind or another. And not all public authorities are equally wealthy. Not all public authorities have d very deep, deep po pockets. Many public authorities in this time of austerity are struggling to keep their budgets under control and a heavy costs order against them. Or, in, or we'll put it another way, winning a judicial review but still having to pay the bulk of their own costs is a rather unattractive prospect. Uh, and it seems to me that 
if one is in the subject in the public interest <coughs> going to encourage judicial reviews or make judicial ju judicial reviews possible by the use of costs one should, should throw the adverse costs burden onto the central government as a whole rather than onto particular public authorities which is what the protective uh, costs order does um, anyway uh, the Lord Chancellor the previous Lord Chancellor was very upset about protective costs orders particularly when one was sought in the Plantagenet Alliance case as well um, and we now have uh, section 88 providing for the capping of costs a costs capping order may not be made in the High Court or the Court of Appeal in connection with judicial review proceedings except in accordance with these sections so it's an exclusive remedy you have to fit within the statute to get a cost capping order or you get nowhere at all there's no fallback to the to the common law uh, as a as an alternative then I pick up the statute again at subsection 3 the court may make a cost capping order only if leave to apply for judicial review has been granted now protective costs orders were generally made after leave had been granted but it was at least open for an applicant to ask for a protective costs order before even applying for leave and one should not overlook the burden of leave costs that uh, in fact a great deal of work uh, <coughs> particularly in England now that the acknowledgement of services is there threatening to strike a knockout blow against your application the, a lot of the costs are front loaded that go into the leave application rather than um, rather than rather than just a trivial matter of putting together a few forms and putting it into the High Court. So now the full leave costs are there to discourage the making of an application. You can't get a protective costs order before leave stage. The court may make a costs cap in order only if it's satisfied that the proceedings are public interest proceedings and that the applicant for judicial review would withdraw or cease to participate in the proceedings if, they didn't, if one wasn't made in their favour and it would be reasonable for the applicant to do so. And they public interest proceedings only if an issue that is the subject of the proceedings is of general public importance and the public interest requires the issue to be resolved and the proceedings are likely to provide an appropriate means of doing so. And then the matters, there are matters which the court must have regard to when determining whether proceedings are public interest proceedings and these include the number of people likely to be directly affected relief is granted to the applicant for judicial review how significant the effect of those people is likely to, to be and whether the proceedings involve consideration of appointed court general considerations there's a unattractive Henry VIII clause allowing the Lord <coughs> Chancellor to change it all if he changes his mind, which is, seems to me, in principle, questionable. And that's the position now. We have an exclusive statutory and more restrictive regime for the making of cost capping orders instead of the previous common law regime of the protective costs orders. Now, where do we go from this for Hong Kong? What are the lessons for Hong Kong? Well, I've already indicated, and this is sort of slightly outside the scope of my paper, but I needed to explain it to so that the, it should be seen in top context. Uh, as far as I'm aware, there are no plans in Hong Kong to transmute the application to, for leave into an inter partes procedure, as it is in England, but it will remain an ex parte procedure. Um, for my, my own view is that there are real benefits to having the acknowledgement of service as part of the application for, for, for judicial review. And what is, the, what is the real use of allowing a application that is doomed to fail to get beyond the leave stage if there is something fundamentally wrong with it but which has not been 
revealed in the applicant's uh, application. But it seems to me that it's a completely unnecessary to require the judge to certify that an application is totally without merit. It is just a, an additional complexity and often an expense thrown into the judicial review process. It seems to me too that the Hong Kong should not elevate the no difference principle into statute. It's already there in the common law, it plays a useful role, but to force it into the statute in the way that we have done in or to force it into the procedural rules to be uh, technically accurate, the way that we have done in England, uh, is entirely unnecessary and once more just makes judicial review more complicated and extra things to consider by the judge in making the decision. On the bringing of applications for judicial review by shell companies that collapse when an adverse costs order is made against them, I can see some sense in that. It seems to me that the real backers of litigation should be the persons who are at risk of an adverse costs order. And you shouldn't be able to avoid that by setting up a shell company. I'm sure that phenomenon uh, is to be found in, in Hong Kong. And a, a, a solution needs to be worked out. It does seem to me that in England, we have once more taken a shed sledgehammer to crack a nut in that we now require financial disclosure in each and every case. There should be a provision that requires financial disclosure only if a protective costs order is sought uh, or if the respondent in effect worries that he's not going to get his costs and has some sort of procedure whereby he can apply for security. Uh, or disclosure of the details. As far as protective costs orders, cost capping orders are, are concerned, uh, as far as I'm aware, no, no PCO has yet been made in, in Hong Kong, but the courts have recognized in several places that a protective costs order could be made in, in, in Hong Kong, and they have moreover, in cases such as the Chu Hoi Dick case, which I've put on the list, uh, refused to follow the, the normal rule and have refused in the public or interest to order costs in favour of a successful respondent, which is uh, a protective costs order that arrived a bit too late. And of course, the, such a protective, uh, su such an order, although obviously just in particular circumstances, does not have the benefit of giving a, a worthy claimant the guarantee, the financial guarantee that their costs will be limited at the state at the time that they need it uh, when the application is being brought. Uh, Mr. Justice Lamb set out the three, three requirements. Uh, as you can see, they overlap significantly with those required for a uh, protective costs order. I'm not going to go through them uh, in detail now. It seems unnecessary. It is thus only a question of time before protective costs order will be made in Hong Kong, but it is, it seems, unlikely that Hong Kong will weaken the requirement of the litigant not having an interest in the litigation, as Mr. Justice Lamb stresses that in his uh, judgment in Chu Hoi Dick. And that, with some lessons for Hong Kong, has been an art outline of the recent reforms in the application for judicial review. Thank you for listening so patiently to this rather generous presentation. Thank you very much, Professor Falsai. Professor Falsai is happy to take questions from the floor. Is there anyone who wish to ask a question? I'm sure somebody must have a question. I, I, if I can just shout from here a question. Yes. I, I didn't realize that security for costs was not a JR applications. What's the rationale for that? I think that's a very good question that's got me, got me completely, completely stumped. I think 
The rationale is mostly that claimants don't, are rather badly off. You would not be able to provide security if you get security for costs. Even if a company? Yeah, well, a company would be one problem, would be one thing. But an individual applicant is what I had in mind. If you had security for costs, you just close it down altogether. Um, but as far as I know, security has never been granted in an application for judicial review. And I'm not quite sure why that is so. Okay. Not provided for in the rules. Can I ask a, an impolite question? Sorry. Unnecessary. My questions are always impolite. Um, at the end of all this, uh, what is the point of judicial review? It seems to me that in the situation of Hong Kong, given all that, it will be only big developers who will be able to bring a judicial review because they're not afraid of any cost implications. I thought the or origin of judicial review is to protect the rule of law. Is there anything left of that? Well, it's not an impolite question at all, Margaret. <laughs> I, I wonder whether you're going to come to the conference of Magna Carta at the weekend. <laughs> we, can, we, 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 we can discuss the extent of the rule, rule, rule of law. Um, I'm not sure what the logical consequences of your question are. Uh, is it that everyone who wanted to apply for judicial review could apply for judicial review without there being any regard to costs, that a beneficent state should dig deep into their pockets and pay for any judicial review that any, shall we say, not very rich applicant uh, wishes, to, wishes to make. And I think the, the pockets of the state are simply not, not deep enough to, to allow that. Particularly, it would have such a, a free judicial review would encourage so many, so many applications. I think it is the truth that the rule of law would be enhanced if litigation in the public interest were, more, were encouraged more. And I, I'd entirely agree, agree with that. But if you look around Hong Kong, it seems to me that there's a benefit of judicial review in many cases where the applicants are not big commercial firms uh, and people have benefit for, benefited from applications for judicial review, uh, even when they've got to face up to the costs consequences thereof. Yeah. Okay, uh, can I ask, uh, what is the general public sentiment um, towards judicial review? Are they positive or negative, uh, and also is it common for the UK government to sort of condemn or say things negatively about judicial review applications which seeks to cause delay to government's uh, project or decision? Is there happening in UK or not? Well, the, 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 the problem of an application for judicial review delaying important infrastructural project projects is one of the things that motivated uh, Chris Grayling. Um, I don't think that he, it was possible to find a significant m number of these applications where infrastructure propositions had been delayed for many years by judicial review. Infrastructure projects are much delayed by the planning system, which seems to take forever and drags on greatly. But relatively few of them are actually caused by, by judicial, judicial review. Uh, occasionally that, that's so. There was a judicial review that contributed partly to the uh, high speed two train, train line development. Uh, but in comparison to the delays that it is experienced in, in Parliament, those are, are relatively, relatively slight. But this is what the this is what the leave requirement is, is supposed to do. That if, um, if a public, a public, there's a real public interest in ensuring that the decisions of public authorities are known to be valid or invalid in a relatively short period of time. 
And that's clear, and I think everyone recognizes that, that public interest. That's why we have the relatively short time limit of, of three months in the application for, for judicial review. If, um, if the judicial review is, if leave to apply for judicial review is granted, that must be because the judge takes the view that there's a good arguable case. And the vindication of that good arguable case is the public interest that then justifies any further delays. But in England, again, we have a, a provision whereby the application for judicial review can be expedited, you know, heard more earlier than would otherwise be the case. And I believe there's a similar provision in, in, in Hong Kong, although I'm not immediately familiar with it. So one hopes that stratagems of that kind prevent the the grave damage to the public interest that otherwise results uh, from delays within the judicial review process. But I think many of those, those delays come about again through appeals to the Court of Appeal and the Court of Final Appeal rather than the initial judicial review. One has to face up to the fact that, that, that there are delays in the, in, in the application of the, of the law. But if the case can be made that these are seriously contrary to the public interest, then clearly something must be done to speed up the judicial review, review process. I'm just not sure that the particular reforms I've been looking at here, here today actually has to have that result, because many of them, it seems to me, slow down the process by requiring financial, in financial information to be provided, by requiring totally without merit to be certified, by requiring no difference to be considered. All of these just add to the complexity of the process. You always will have to hear what the other side has to say, and so it, can, so it goes on, uh, taking up time and, and money in the hearing. Um, this uh, kind of uh, changes uh, imposing additional procedural uh, limitations in applying for judicial review that are mainly introduced by the administration. I want to know whether this uh, is affected by a consideration that in recent years the courts uh, try to expand the substantial principles of review so that uh, if cases reach the court then uh, to substantial hearing, the chance that the government may lose the case will be higher as the court is uh, expanding, like you have uh, the uh, more review on factual error, on uh, legitimate expectation, and even maybe proportionality. Would that be a consideration for introducing this kind of procedural limitations? In formal terms, the answer to that question is no, that these reforms have been justified on, on procedural grounds. Applications for judicial review that have been uh, considered to be undertaken for some ulterior purpose and have not been directed against the courts extending the grounds of judicial review. But it's undeniable that <clears throat> the courts have been extending the grounds of judicial review and have therefore made it more likely that judicial reviews will succeed because as the grounds, uh, grounds extend, that's just another error for the respondent to make, opening up the prospect of a successful uh, application for, for, for judicial review. So uh, some of the growth in judicial review must be the result uh, of the extension of the grounds of, uh, of judicial review. Uh, but this is a, a much broader d discussion as to the, uh, whether the judges have been guilty of judicial overreach uh, or, whether the, or whether they haven't. I mean, I think in, in England, if I may change the subject slightly and just say a word or two about the, <coughs> the Evans case, which was something I thought I might talk a bit about in, in, in Hong Kong, it's about freedom of information and the Freedom of Information Act. But uh, I looked it up in Hong Kong, and of course you don't have a Freedom of Information <laughs> Act. Um, so it's, it seemed uh, an, an inappropriate topic to talk about in Hong Kong. But I'll say just a short bit thing, thing about, uh, about Evans. Um, our Freedom of Information Act says that um, there are various things that are absolutely exempt from disclosure. And then there are other things that are subject to a qualified uh, exemption. 
in that they aren't revealed unless it can be shown that the balance of public interest lies in their exclusion or, or their disclosure. The balance of public interest lies in, in favour of their disclosure. And those that are subject to a qualified disclosure of, the, of that kind are also subject to an executive override in that the Attorney General has given, is given the power when he considers that the balance of public interest lies in the other direction to override the determination of the upper tribunal previously mentioned uh, that the documents should be disclosed. And these um, um, and, and, and that's the provision in, in, our, in our human right in our freedom of information law. And this comes to the, to the fore with the letters that Prince Charles had been writing to ministers, that Prince Charles would correspond with ministers saying, I'm awfully concerned about this or I'm awfully concerned about that. And the ministers would have to reply to the correspondence and, and, and deal with them on its merits. Um, and a lot of people, some people, thought that this was terrible, that Prince Charles should be writing these letters. Other people take the view that uh, anybody can write to, to the minister in confidence and not expect their, new, their letter to be uh, on the front page of the newspaper shortly thereafter. Anyway, what happened here is that the upper tri tribunal determined that the public interest called for the disclosure of the documents. Prince Charles's, they called the Black Spider Amendment, you know, because of his handwriting. Um, that the other tribunal had determined that they should be disclosed. And the Attorney General overrode that and gave a certificate saying that the public interest was in favour of them being kept secret. So for absolute no interest to me which of those propositions are right or wrong. But what is of interest is that it went to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court, in effect, excised the executive override from the Act in that it said that there were no grounds upon which the, the Attorney General could override a decision of the Upper Tribunal because the Upper Tribunal was a court uh, and they had, the Attorney General had to accept the facts and the law is found by the court, the upper tribunal, and the facts and the law is found by the court included where the balance of public interest lay. And therefore, uh, in effect, there was no executive override. Now, that's an immensely bold decision, as you will appreciate, because it effectively takes out of the act the executive override. Bearing in mind our parliament is, is sovereign can make or make any law at all. The Supreme Court has decided that there is a particular law that it, although it didn't say it was doing this in terms, it said should be, um, should effectively be removed from the statute. And that may well lead to some form of legislative, legislative response. So there is an issue with judicial overreach in the United Kingdom. I'm not saying there's judicial overreach of the, uh, in, in Hong Kong. But of course, what one must realize about judicial review, it is a, it is a tapestry. And if you, you pull in one place, it gives in another place. So everything is connected. So um, of course, an over, overbroad extension of the grounds of judicial review encourages applications for judicial review which may encourage the leave test to become more different, which has all sorts of knock-on effects as one goes through, goes through it. It's a tapestry. I wonder if you might share with us some of the um, responses of the pressure groups in the UK to the financial disclosure requirement. I'm aware that in Hong Kong at least it's caused some jitters uh, necessarily because uh, some of the groups thrive on and depend on the ability to keep financial contributions uh, to their societies private. Uh, and so they're wondering um, whether this means that invariably they'll be left out dry and not able to pursue these applications going forward if such an order is made. Well, the, the, the short answer to that is that 
they won't be able to. Uh, I, we have a statute that says the disclosure must be made, and there's no provision made for uh, for keeping the identity of your your donors uh, uh, secret. So uh, it is a problem. There's no 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 doubt about that. But but but, but I suppose the uh, the counter argument is going to be that if you bring in an application for judicial review. Oughtn't we to know who actually stands behind this application for judicial review? And if you, are, I mean, what is the, what is the proper reason for a uh, an NGO to keep secret the fact that it's getting money from? Um, well, it might be Taiwan, for instance. <laughs> But one can see why they might want to. What is the proper reason for keeping the source of funds secret? Are you going to can I just say that some donors, I mean, they give on the basis that they don't want their name to be And they may be a, a, a major philanthropist, but they prefer their philanthropy to be kept, kept secret. So I think there, there is a genuine concern that um, donations to, to charitable organizations might dry up. For instance, there is a real concern at the moment that the Inland Revenue is going through a process of reviewing the charitable status of, of various organizations. Now, if one organization is said not to be a charity and they wish to judicially review that decision by the Inland Revenue, is it right then that they should be compelled to reveal all, all their donors, and, and indeed some of the donors may say, I'm particularly concerned about this, <laughs> therefore I'm going to put in some more funds to help you um, judicially review this decision. I, I, I think you, know, you have to look at the background in Hong Kong, and there are perfectly legitimate reasons for people not to wish their philanthropy to be known. Yeah, I, I, I fully see the force of that. Uh of, of that pro pro provision, of that point of view, that there might be individuals who want to do good by stealth and keep 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 that keep that secret, um, and I don't know what the answer to that I don't know what the answer to that is, but this is an, in a way the old problem of of supporting uh, litigation uh, without revealing where you get your money from. I mean that's much older than, than judicial review. But I recognise that there will be philanthropists who want to do good and to keep that uh, confidential and will therefore, rather than make an, a donation, not make a donation at all. Um, but from the way you, you're, you're speaking, it sounds as if there's been a development in Hong Kong that I don't know about, that they are consider, <laughs> they're considering these... Uh, I can tell you the NGO world in Hong Kong is very concerned. Is this about the design in Hong Kong case? It's not specifically that that's part of it, but um, it's, it's a more broad um, concern about the review being conducted by the Indian Revenue. Right. We have a problem with uh, the Charities Commission in the, in the UK too, becoming far more difficult about charitable status and wanting to test very carefully to see that you claim to be a charity but you actually spend the money for charitable purposes. But perhaps in the UK there is not a growing fear that any challenge of government authority would land them in trouble. <laughs> perhaps UK people are rather delighted in challenging the government and anybody who funds little people to challenge a government is looked at with admiration instead of with loathing. Well, <laughs> how can I respond to that? Uh, so I, I'm ju just trying to suggest that there is a political dimension yeah. in Hong Kong. There's a political dimension in the UK, in the UK too, in that um, the opposition parties fought these reforms hard. Um, and we will doubtless, as I anticipate, the political battle is going to shift towards reform of human rights law, which, which will be coming in, in, in a little while. And I think that's where the, the political battle will do in the UK. 
but uh, it, it has to be said that no, nobody in uh, nobody in the UK is is fearful of political consequences. Um, are you? Uh, but I know that some people in Hong Kong are fearful of political consequences. Um, but I don't think liberty is yet dead in Hong Kong. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> okay. I think it's time for us to shall we end our discussion here because it's uh, 10 past 6. So if any one of you would like to uh, chat with Professor Forsyth, um, please uh, join us in the tea reception uh, on the third floor. We will have a tea reception on the 319. So please join me to thank Professor Forsyth for the excellent uh, discussion. Thank you.